Hello. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming. Um, my name is Oli Devoton. I'm the chief executive of the Careers and Enterprise Company. Uh, uh, hello to people in the audience. Uh, I feel like it's like a bingo call here. I don't quite know what's going on here. Um, and then also to those of you at home watching online or in the office. So thank you for joining us today. Yeah. Um, I'm just going to do a quick bit of introduction and thanks and then uh, get into this uh, really, really important uh, question. Um, so firstly, thank you uh, very much, uh, Karen, for having us. Uh, for those Londoners in the room or online, uh, you'll know that the London Transport Museum is a place where you go for auxiliary childcare. Um, and this is the first place, uh, I, first time I've come here without my six and two-year-old, so it's a sort of liberating experience, although I do need to bring back some bus things for them. Um, so thank you. Uh, thank, uh, uh, thanks, so thank you for, for having us today, and thank you, Ollie, from The Edge for agreeing to chair the panel, and for our brilliant panellists who uh, will let us, uh, who will introduce themselves uh, in a minute. Uh, so we're the Careers and Enterprise Company, um, and this uh, career, this uh, excellent seminar series is, is something new for us, supported extremely kindly by the Gatsby Foundation, the stalwarts of careers education and everything technical uh, in this country. Uh, and the goal really is to think about the questions that, f that are facing the system of careers and skills and get some practitioners to help us understand what the innovation is and where we might uh, go next. So this is the second one uh, of, uh, of these series uh, and we're really, we're really interested to get feedback after to see is this the sort of thing that will help us uh, on the ground. Um, so just by way of introduction, we've called this Ready for the Future, uh, but this question of getting employers and educators to work together is long-standing. As early back as 1888, uh, Sir Philip Magnus, a royal commissioner for the then uh, Victorian government, said uh, or asked, uh, what role can schools have in preparing children for the world of life? Uh, and since then, I think we've been debating this same question. And I think it's fair to say we've gone through many iterations. Uh, but I think the reason I bring that up is that this is about the future, but it's also about the past. It's about understanding what has worked, what hasn't worked, and where we might uh, go next. Um, so we've got people here today who are thinking about where where we can build on those uh, lessons learned and what the future might hold. So I think I'm optimistic. I'm an optimistic person by nature because what we've got in this country now is something called careers education, uh, which is there is consensus about. People kind of agree. Yeah, we need careers education. One, that's a good thing. Not everyone always agrees with that. Uh, second, to get good careers education, we need pe these people called careers leaders in schools who are going to lead it. So that's tick. And then we need employers, uh, people out there who really care about supporting young people into the world of work. And then when we get those employers and those careers leaders and schools together, some incredible magic can happen. And we know because we've got some data now. Schools and colleges across the country are saying when they work with employers, they're getting more career readiness for their young people. Young people are saying when they meet more employers in a meaningful way, they're more ready for the world of work. And the system as a whole is saying when we improve our careers provision, young people are more likely to take up an apprenticeship, they're less likely to be neat. And that effect, that careers education effect, is double in schools facing the most disadvantaged, uh, serving the most disadvantaged communities. So that should give us hope. But when we've got hope, we've got to build on hope. So then what I want us to think about, then what we're going to think about today is what would it do to reimagine those connections between employers and educators so that, yes, we can build on the progress, but we can imagine what's possible. And I tried to do this as a head teacher, and I pr probably failed as much as I succeeded. But I had a thought. These ideas of experiences with, with uh, employers was just an opportunity for rigorous learning. If we were going to send young people out for two weeks, three weeks, in, I ca in my case, we sent them out half a day a week for the whole of year 10, what would it mean to make that experience the most meaningful possible for that young person? What would it mean to make that experience with an employer the skills-building moment in that young person's life, where they learn how to speak really well to employers, they learn how to lead, where they learn how to work uh, as a team? And what would happen if we did all of that in a rigorous way, we assessed it, and we made sure that young people had something to show for it at the end? Now, I'm not saying I'm probably, uh, you know, there are people here in the, the audience, uh, I can see Cassie here who helped design this program. You know, we, we weren't always successful, but the idea of reimagining something that could build skills in young people and get them ready for the world of work, get them ready for an apprenticeship or fulfill their aspirations, I think is a worthy question. So I'm hoping our panelists will have the answers for us. I'm sure they will. Uh, and I'm hoping as a community of people interested in careers and skills, we can take forward the learning and just improve the outcomes for young people. So thank you very much. I'll hand over to the better Ollie. Welcome to our uh, <laughs> colleagues who are joining us online. 
Um, always good to test the chair at the start. So um, it's lovely to have everyone with, the, with us. We know hundreds of people have signed up online. And it's great, um, as Ollie was just saying, but you may not have heard um, uh, that careers has floated so much to the, to the kind of top of the level of importance. And we've got careers leaders and colleagues joining us from right across the country. So it's lovely to, to see you here. I think the topic of today is just so important. We see every day how much of a difference, really good quality uh, opportunities to experience the world of work have for young people, um, both in terms of helping them to think about their future careers, benchmark six, of course, and I know I'm talking to colleagues who've memorized the benchmarks, um, but also really connecting in through benchmark four to the curriculum as well. So bringing different subjects to life, uh, helping them think about how what they're learning, both in terms of knowledge, but also skills and behaviors really connects to the real world uh, and kind of inspiring them to do that. And of course, for employers, like some on the panel, you know, we're looking at the pipeline of talent for them as well. So there's a really strong reason for them to support workplace experiences as well. So uh, I've got a brilliant panel with me. So I'm going to uh, go straight into uh, introducing them and getting them to give them your, their perspectives in a second. But just to remind you, the kind of key question for today, what does excellence and experience of the workplace look like? So I want to keep this discussion really positive, really practical. Uh, I know lots of you who are joining online are working in this area. So you're going to be looking for tips, tricks, ideas. Um, and we're going to come first to Karen. Really lovely to see you, Karen. Um, Karen is head of talent uh, for Transport for London. And Karen, I wonder if you could start by telling us a little about the employer perspective and the way that you're engaging uh, students in this. Sure, and I also want to reiterate a big welcome to those in the room, to the London Transport Museum. We're very, very fortunate in Transport for London to have this in our portfolio because we do use it to inspire young people. So please do make use of going around the museum afterwards. And if you're at home and you haven't been and you come to London, please visit. It's a great, it's a great museum. Um, I apologise, I'm a little bit croaky. I started to lose my voice a couple of days ago, so I hope you can hear me even with Mike. Um, so I just wanted to raise a couple of points here on um, what makes great uh, experience of work. And, and I think the first thing I'll say is about making sure it's blended. Um, so moving away from just that one touch point once a year of work experience in the summer. Um, but what we try to do is to reach out to young people and to educators um, to ensure that there's an ongoing blended approach, um, which might consist of both uh, virtual and in person and I think one thing we've all experienced as a result of COVID it also all forced us into a virtual space and actually what we've learned from that is that virtual interaction has enabled us to reach more young people by doing things virtual as well as in person so I would certainly endorse having a hybrid approach and I think it's fair to say that if you work in an office-based environment now, that is now the way of work. We work virtually. I don't come into the office five days a week. I, uh, today is a prime example of that. There's a number of us virtually and in person. Um, I'm in the office maybe a couple of days a week. It depends on what, what I'm doing. Um, so young people need to know how to adapt to that. And if they're moving from education, which is now predominantly all in person, they need to have those skills to be able to adapt to that virtual environment in the workplace. So I think that's really important. I do hasten to add there's some careers where that doesn't apply because obviously if you're driving a tube train, you can't do that virtually. Well, who knows? <laughs> We're going that direction, so who knows? Um, so there are some careers which are in person. So I think that's the first thing is a mix of virtual and in person. I think the second thing is a mix of different opportunities to different insights to different employers um, and different careers. Um, so within Transport for London, um, we have hundreds and thousands of jobs, actually. We have 28,000 people who work for us doing very different types of jobs. And so it's exposing people to all those different types of careers in the workplace, but also making sure working with small companies too, because they are big, uh, offer lots of jobs in, in the UK, um, and making sure you get some insight to small organisations that might be more appropriate for some young people. So it's giving that breadth of insight. Um, and the other thing I would say is diversity in terms of um, seeing people that look like them. So we try and encourage our people to engage with young people. And actually, we don't have much difficulty encouraging them. They love it. Um, but making sure that you've got people with different lived experiences so young people can relate to people like them and that might look like them, that might have come from a similar background to them, and be inspired and know that actually if, if they've done it and they've come into a career working place, maybe they've come from a care background, that they can also achieve that, and it's inspiring those young people that everything is possible for them and there's no door shut. So that's just the top level. I could say a lot more, but I'm sure I'll get told to be quiet. So uh, those are just the three top-line um, tips that I wanted to give. 
Amazing. Thank you so much, Karen. And I'm, I'm going to get some exercise today, which I wasn't expecting, because I'm going to have to walk across the stage and pass this over. So next, I'd like to welcome Iman. And Iman and I were talking beforehand, and Iman would like a career in TV. So if things going wrong with tech, I mean, this is all in your bag, right? You're in charge. Um, but you're studying at Global Academy. Oh, just my. Oh, even better. OK, so I can say sit um, So Iman, um, yeah, we'd love to hear a bit about your experiences of the workplace so far and what um, you found useful. So I go to the Global Academy, which is a specialist media UTC. And um, what they offer is they offer us loads of like, different work experiences. They um, email out like a newsletter full of different opportunities that we can partake in. Um, I was fortunate enough to be able to have quite a few of those work experiences. And I, I did a work experience when I was in year 10 as well, because you, know, you do it through the summer when you're younger. And the two of them really do differ very differently because you know that is a secondary school where you're learning so many different core subjects English math science whereas where I go now is more specialized into like one subject which we focus on media so I do creative media and we get to work with loads of different brands like Capital and the BBC um, and what I've realized is that it's really important that with your work experience, it kind of aligns with what you want to do in the future. And of course, it's okay if you don't know what that is because, you know, you are young, so you're never going to know what it is until you finally realise what it is. Um, but I feel like, you know, looking at what your young person might be interested in and hearing all their different interests can really help pinpoint where their placement should be and how they can get the most out of it. Because when I was in secondary school, you know, I was working in a receptionist's office, which is very drastically different from what it is that I want to do now. And while it may not have been exactly what I want to do in the future, all work experience is positive experience because you are still learning um, about how to be in a professional environment. And so I feel like regardless of what you do, it's important to like kind of, you know, get the most out of it. But if you could... Um, you know, find a placement that really does align with your interests. That is how I feel like you would get the most out of it. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Iman. Some great tips for young people, but also that really important point. Like, any experience of work is good. It gives you those transferable skills, but so much more inspirational if it's something that you're kind of really keen to do. Um, wonderful. I'd like to welcome Vinette now. Hi, Vinette. Uh, Vinette is Assistant Principal at All Saints Academy in Dunstable. Uh, I wonder if you could tell us a little bit, Vinette, about how you support your students to have those experiences and then to use those to help them think about kind of what happens to them in the future. Okay, thank you. I think when I was 16 years old, that was about five years ago, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I had the brilliant experience that I wanted to be a doctor after watching just one episode of Trappers on MD. I wanted to be a doctor. So I went into my local um, GP back in Jamaica and I said, can I get a day's experience? Well, the first experience was actually taking blood. And I cannot remember anything else because I was on the floor. <laughs> after that. <laughs> that for me was a shocking experience because even though it was an experience of the workplace, it gave me a valuable lesson. This job is not for me. Change your route. So with work experiences, quite a lot of people think to think, go for the positive or go for things that you want to do. But sometimes the best experience you can get from a work experience is what? Learning about yourself. So knowing what you like, what you dislike, and that will help you sometimes signpost you to the correct field that you want to go into. So I always tell my students, be open to experience, be open to new things, to find out and learn more about yourself, learn the things that makes you tick. You might find that you're more sympathetic than you thought you were when you get into a particular job or a particular role, and that is something that you want to explore. And that is one of the reasons we want to do work experiences very early, because you can actually explore those options and those skill set that you find that you never have or you never focused on it before. There are kids that are taking care of their um, siblings, and that is a skill set that you can develop to actually lead you into a career because that is something you enjoy doing. So it's exploring those different options with your work experience. Obviously, one of the things that gets from work experience is you open your eyes to different experiences, don't you? Because you don't know what is out there until you get into that particular field and you understand the different nuances of different jobs when you get there. I mean, it's, it's, it's like social media, it's all glamorous. I want to be an engineer, I want to be a doctor. But have you considered the day-to-day -day impact of how that is going to affect you as a young person? So I think the work experience actually open up your awareness of the different things that you need for a career, not just the qualifications, not just the experience, but what it's like working in that particular field, the challenges, the barriers, and then you can make a more informed decision toward that. 
I also say to my students and staff, and this probably came back to bite me a few days ago, I said to them, what is your first experience of the workplace? And most people go to the year 10 work experience or the year 12 work experience and say that's the first experience. Actually, no. Your first experience of a workplace is walking into a school because that is a workplace. And that is where we need to capitalize because that is a daily occurrence right in front of our students. This is a workplace. The head teacher has a job, the teacher has a job, the canteen lady has a job. It is a workplace. And I've said to them as well, positive and negative. You can tell when a person is excited about their job, when they have made the right choice and made the right decision for the job. And I did that with my students one morning in assembly, telling them, look around at people. You can see how enthused they are to come in. And unfortunately, they ran into a teacher who just did not want to be there. <laughs> <laughs> and they were like, miss, I think she made the wrong choice in terms of career. <laughs> and I'm thinking, well, that is an experience for you. So make sure you're making the right decision so that when you go into work, you still maintain that enthusiasm that joy when you walk into a workplace. The other element of work experience that I tap into with my kids are the informal one, because the Gatsby benchmark really give you that formalized process to know that we can actually have accountability in terms of experience of the workplace. But there are so many other informal bits and pieces coming in. Quite a few students do part-time jobs. I want to tap into that to find out what they're learning and how they're actually accessing certain things and what are the skills they're developing and value that. So it's about that constant reflective element about what they're doing. What did you learn today? Did a difficult customer come in? Were you able to deal with it? And just actually showcase in those skill sets and actually work with the formal and the informal. And I think it gives me a nice comprehensive picture and feel of the students to know, OK, when the career advisor comes in, I don't just shove them into a room and say, sit there and talk to the career advisor. I can have that conversation to say, well, Sophie's doing that. She does a part-time job there. She's a carer. She's that background to actually make sure all of those experiences are valued and they get a nice comprehensive and external output in terms of what they should go for, the careers that they should look for. And I find that helps them really make informed decisions so they don't walk around the workplace in 10 years being grumpy, but actually with a buzz because that's the right choice they've made. I love it. I love that key performance indicator. Excited people in the workplace in 10 years' time. <laughs> and that, that example of your first work experience is definitely going to stick with me. Um, <laughs> but I think that point about kind of getting a realistic understanding of what a job's like as well. Karen, you and I were talking just before this about tube drivers being on their own, mm. you know, run, running the tube, playing a really safety critical role. But that, you know, you wouldn't guess that. It's kind of a job where you have to kind of see that in action to understand that. Um, we're going to have a little uh, look at a trust-wide view now. So Ellis Potter is going to join us. He's Strategic Careers Lead for the Priory Federation of Academies Trust. So you get a chance to look across a whole trust of schools, Ellis. How do you kind of plan careers engagement at that level? Yeah, so I, I think you know, 15 minutes in and I'm already so inspired by the panel. I think that that's at the heart of the planning and development stage for us as a trust is you talk about experience of the workplace and I think everybody gets inspired by the the impact that it has on the students and the students come back after their three days out or the visit they've, they've been on and, and they come back and they can articulate what they've learned, what they've seen, what they've done, the skills they've gained. And that's, that's almost the, at the heart of that planning and development stage. So, so for us, it's, it's around really capturing that with all of our stakeholders within the trust. So we, we don't treat experience of the workplace and the strategy for work experience as a one-person role. It, it doesn't fall to me. It doesn't fall just to our... You know, very brilliant careers teams. Um, it, it, it's a cross-trust, cross-academy um, initiative. So we work with our safeguarding teams, our SEND teams, our data teams, um, our health and safety teams to make sure that the experience is as impactful as, as we can possibly make it. Um, and and then we, you know, as well as our staff, I talk about our stakeholders, our, uh, our students. So, so making sure that, that they're absolutely clear what work experience is meant to do for them um, depending on which model that, that, that they participate in, make sure that they've got that absolute clarity that, that they are going to learn something, they're going to do something, they're going to gain certain skills and that they can come back and really understand that. Um, I'd also add our parents and our carers into that, that stakeholder group that, that again, we're, we're reimagining work experience, um, you know, the, the traditional idea of this block placement. You know, some of our academies don't go through that model. So it's around, that, around being really clear with them that... that as we're planning and developing the strategy, that, that that is a very different model, but just as impactful for the students. Um, and, and then employers. Um, I think post-COVID, you know, we've we've had almost a, a, a stay of relief from, from work experience. We haven't had we haven't done it for, for so many years. Um, so it's about reintegrating employers into that model and, and making sure that we're working with them 
Um, we're not directing to them what work experience will look like. We're working with them to understand actually in our local context, in our labour market, what, what is going to be impactful for them. So we build all of that into the planning and development across the trust so that each academy can deliver something really impactful for, for the students. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Alice. And time to meet the final member of our panel. So Ben Robinson is Deputy Principal of Middlesbrough College. Um, obviously, FE Colleges have a really close relationship with employers uh, traditionally. But tell us a little bit about how you, how you build that and how you make use of those relationships. Yeah, thanks. Um, I think there's never been a more important time for colleges uh, to collaborate with employers, um, largely on, on what I would say a, a curriculum design perspective. Um, we are now accountable, um, so as part of our Rofsted judgment, we get a skills measure judgment that says we're either strong, you know, are, are we meeting the needs of the local community? Uh, we're just in the middle now of writing an accountability statement that says how we meet those local needs, all driven by local skills improvement plans. So I suppose that, that careers and employer element of our curriculum sits right at the heart of, of what we do. Um, we do have a big business development team because, as you'd expect in FE, we've sold apprenticeships for a long time. We've worked with employers that way. I think for us, it was really upskilling that business development team, expanding that business development team. So we now have workplace coordinators who, are, who sit within each curriculum department. Um, they make sure that um, the knowledge, skills and behaviours that comes through really strongly from the employer forums we hold for any particular career element of that, that career is embedded into that curriculum delivery. Um, and I think that's particularly important for the employees to see the relevance of that because then they're more likely to engage in the placement and that's what we've found. So those employers will really engage with the college if they think those students are you know, really committed to that career, they've had the background knowledge, they get that knowledge in the school and then we, we move that forward. So those accountability measures are, are absolutely critical. Um, another big thing we're dealing with in colleges is curriculum reform. So we have a T-level provision coming in that has that mandatory element of work placement. So we've had to work really hard at that. And I think the matching of the student with that placement is, is, is absolutely you know, a, a critical thing to make sure they get the most out of that placement they go into. And we spend a lot of time with students before they go out on placement, preparing them for that. You know, we have students from entry level right the way up to you know, foundation degree and, and master's degree level at the college across all areas of the curriculum. And I think that pre-placement um, work is absolutely critical for them to get the best out of that. And we involve, involve the employers in that as well. And we found that's been a, re a really positive you know, way to move forward and make sure the students excel in that placement and um, make that decision. You know, is it right for them? Is that the career right for them? Um, and, and take it from there. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Ben. So we're going to move into a bit more of a discussion now. You've had a chance to meet these pan panellists. Ellis has already said he's inspired, so let's keep that momentum up. Um, Vinat, you've got a bit of a, um, a kind of dual role in your school, which is unusual to be careers leader and also SENCO. Now, we know quality is really important, but accessibility is also really important. So I just wondered if you could say a little bit about how you make sure that the kind of experience of the workplace are accessible for all of your students. I think one of the biggest barriers we have with um, placing SEND student, which makes up about 20% of your workforce anyway, so they are going to go into the workforce. I think it's just that lack of awareness and lack of knowledge between employers and sometimes the children themselves. They're a little bit nervous, because what I find with our SEND students is that they like that safe space, and they don't want to come away from the safe space or that safe person. So when we do our SEND placement, it's not a short activity. It's actually starting probably from year nine, and it's just going through different elements, sometimes just visiting the workplace. I'll ask parents, um, he wants to work at Tesco's next week. Sorry for the placement. There are other supermarkets available. <laughs> right. He wants to work at this particular supermarket chain. I'll work with that particular employer. Can he come in? Can you shop there for a half an hour just to get a feel of the place? And then just to develop that relationship with that particular person that you're going to be tapping into. Sometimes I invite them into schools, and we have done this with one student who is very, very close to one particular SSW. And we have actually just extended that process until he actually develop a little bit of trust with that particular person. And so now, when he goes out to work experience a little bit easier because he knows where this is, he knows where that, who to contact, you know, with space to go if he's feeling overwhelmed. And I think it's just that pre-work that needs to be done. It's a little bit more challenging for some of the um, special needs that we have, but for some that is just prepar preparation before to make sure 
any barriers that the employers perceive, we can actually address those beforehand, and any ones that the parents or child perceive, we can address them beforehand. And to be quite honest, I think when you go in front of employers sometimes and have that conversation, it's a little bit easier to convince them, because they might think that they're going to have to do a lot of changes, but sometimes just subtle things. Some of our kids don't want overstimulation. So just adjusting that rule to make sure they're somewhere where they're not going to be overstimulated by different sensory experiences. And it works well so far. It worked well this year, which is the first time I'm actually doing it in that particular role. So that's something we check beforehand. And then in terms of to maintain quality, we have a structured program in place. So most of our students like to know what is happening Monday, what is happening Tuesday, what is going to happen. Although you can't control everything, and it's a part of the experience, you might have a fire drill in the middle, but if you give them enough structure in place, I find that it's easier for them to actually transition, go into the workplace, and then come back to tell me what they have learned or what they have discovered. So it has been quite successful this year for our SEND students. That's really good to hear. And I think, in a way, this kind of theme is coming out of kind of personalization, understanding, uh, kind of making sure the placement is right. Obviously, that's particularly the case for SEN students. But as Ben and Imam were saying, you know, that's important for everyone to get that match right. So it's really kind of a, that, I guess, but extra of much for those who have extra needs. Um, and Karen, you were telling me a bit about some of what you do with um, neurodiverse students. Do you want to say a little bit about how you adapt for them? Yeah, so we have a particular program which is actually, um, it, it's a 12-month program, so it's usually, um, it's for those students who perhaps have finished their qualifications but not yet work ready, and it's a program we do to help them to get work ready and secure paid employment for them at the end. And it's called our Steps into Work program. Um, it's for, it, there's no age restriction on it actually, but it typically tends to be people between the ages of 18 and 24. Um, and what we do is we do three placement rotations. We work in partnership with um, a college, uh, the short, well, with Shore Trust um, in delivering it. And it's a combined academic work skills qualifications alongside in-work experience. And they rotate around three placements in our business. Actually, one of those placements is usually a station placement working with our customer services systems out on platform, which sometimes with these students you'd be surprised, um, but they actually really build their confidence. And what the aim of that is to help build their um, the ability to have coping mechanisms um, and to build their confidence and also to help them identify what they're really good at and what they enjoy so they can actually make informed decisions around the sort of career that they want to follow. Um, and it's, it's one of the most um, impactful programs we run. Um, I actually get very mo emotional when we do our end of program event. Um, and I have parents and carers coming up just to say, you've changed our lives, because it really makes a difference for these, these people. Um, and about 80% of them end up in paid employment, compared to 6% of those who are uh, with learning disabilities or neurodivergent in, in London. So it has a massive success, success rate. And I also want to say on that, that one of the reasons we do that is you're absolutely right to say there's a lot of people in the workplace who are neurodivergent or have, um, have special needs. Um, and often they've hidden it, you know, it's been stigma and they've hidden it. Um, and one of the reasons we do this is to educate our own people in how to work with their colleagues, how to work with their team members, to make sure they're adapting and making adjustments and being considerate and seeing the talent they can bring to the workplace rather than seeing the things that maybe they do differently to other colleagues. Um, and it opens the eyes of our people um, to make it a much more inclusive workplace. And we're here to serve London as well, and a lot of our customers um, also come from this, this, um, this category. So we need to make sure that our transport network is accessible, and therefore we've got to employ people that are designing transport services to be mindful of that population. So we get real business benefit out of it for our people as well as, as, as the, people, the participants on the programme. I love that. That's fantastic. And, and, and that's really important as well. Like All of this gives organisations benefits as well. As you say, being a more inclusive workplace uh, is going to make everyone feel more included, more happy. We're all different. So um, it brings that kind of excellent kind of positive to, to your business as well. Let me just see if any of the others on the panel want to come in on this kind of accessibility point. Um, Iman. I think that, I don't know if it kind of stems from accessibility, but I feel like when you are at school and you know, you're going for your careers meetings with your school's careers advisor. I feel like it's really important that we get more time with them. I feel like there's not enough time spent between career advisor and student often enough. Um, I remember that we would only have ours maybe like once every few weeks, if that, like maybe once a month. And I feel like, like time with the careers advisor needs to be taken as seriously as a school subject. 
because how are you meant to get to know your student and know what it is that they're really after if you don't know them? And to only know them, you need to spend time with them. So I feel like in the future, I feel like students and careers education um, people <laughs> would really benefit from like having an, slot, an allotted amount of time each week the way that you would with your subject teachers so that you can really get the most out of it. Because I feel like a lot of students, I know when I was at school, we would all come together and we'd be like, oh, my meeting's coming up. I just don't really want to go because I'm not getting anything out of it. But it's, it's not that we're not getting anything out of it. We haven't got enough time to get anything out of it. So I feel like if, if institutions really dedicate the time for careers, we would excel a lot faster. Excellent. I think there's probably lots of clapping and the virtual space in mind for that point. Um, and just to finish off on that accessibility point, we've done some work recently at the Edge Foundation looking at um, specialist provision and special schools, which often have really amazing kind of uh, focus on uh, workplace experience and things that can be kind of taught to the mainstream. So, um, yeah, just to plug a couple of our reports in that area, I think there's a really important area that um, actually kind of specialist provision can teach mainstream in that space. Um, let's zoom out. And Ellis, let's come back to you. And just um, I, I want to understand a bit more about at a kind of strategic uh, kind of level, because obviously schools are now increasingly in multi-academy trusts. How, how do we get that kind of planning right at that level across a, a multiple uh, range of schools? Yeah, I think for, for us, in, in terms of the, the trust-wide approach, when I talk about our trust-wide approach, we, we very much talk about a it, almost a three-stage process. I think that's, that's important in, in the context of today that, that we are absolutely not there yet. We're still developing our programme, and, and it is a process of continuous development of of the, the strategy around the experience of the workplace. But the, the drivers across the trust is always for us around equity. So equity for all of our students within the trust <coughs> so that students in one academy are not receiving you know, an, an offer that is far superior to, to one of the other academies and also impact. So making sure that those two golden threads drive that trust-wide approach means that throughout our three-stage process, we, we, we are hopefully delivering a, a really impactful uh, experience for students. So in, in terms of that three stages, I'd say our first stage is where we were this time last year. We had very local solutions to work experience. We, we had some academies who were delivering it, some academies who weren't because of COVID recovery and, and the impact of COVID on employers. But, but certainly what we found, we started to cohere that and align it across the trust was at each academy we had you know, an army of, of employer volunteers and, and supportive parents and carers who wanted to support the, the, the process. Um, you know, we had teams of enterprise coordinators and the employer advisor network that, that could support us. So we had a lot of contacts, but it just wasn't being aligned. We're probably at, at stage two now, where that is starting to be, it's being joined together. Every student is accessing the experience of the workplace, um, and, and we're driving that impact through, through, through the strategy, making sure that as I was saying before, there's absolute clarity in all stakeholders around what, what the purpose of that is. But the vision is certainly that over the next year, we go even more differentiated, more targeted, and more sustained in that programme. So more frequent opportunities to experience the workplace, more targeted in terms of where students want to be and where they want to go, um, and really integrating it even further into the academy objective. So I think it's interesting to talk about careers advisors. Our careers advisors are part of our trust team and they do inform our work experience strategy. They're the ones who are sitting down with students for, in our trust, for, for sometimes hours with these students, particularly in our special school. They get a lot of time as part of EHCP meetings. But what we can do is use that to inform what employers we need to find to support our strategy. So I, I think the, the message for me is that it's... It, the main thing is, is to get started um, and, and work across all of your network, work across your academies, work across those employer networks, um, but think about what those core strands are in terms of what, what are your guiding priorities for your work experience strategy in your context and stay true to them as you go through this process of learning about how to actually do it impactfully. I love that image of the kind of army of people out there ready to help. Mm. And, and if we can just marshal them a little bit more, obviously the organic conversations are brilliant, but if we can just organise it a little bit more, it's, it becomes kind of so much more powerful, I think. Um, ben, just kind of translating that model into FE, how do you at the college like set that direction from the senior leadership team to make sure that kind of employer engagement is kind of front and centre? Yeah, I think that point on alignment you made, Alice, is, is key. Um, because we have like we, we have business development teams, we have curriculum teams, we have work placement teams. And what we found when we initiated our career strategy was 
they were still very siloed working. They were traditionally working, one's selling apprenticeships, one's looking for placements, and there was a bit of a duplication of effort across the piece there. Um, and one of the things that we found really, um, you know, uh, positive in moving forward with the strategy is that combined working of the team. So even as simple as the offices they sit in, yeah. the meetings they attend, um, really aligning all that work. So we're not duplicating effort and we're really engaging the biggest, widest range of employers that we, we possibly can. Um, and we've upped our employer engagement at Middlesbrough College by about a thousand employers over a 12 month period because of that. And that's been critical, critical for us because um, we as colleges now have to place students. You know, if they don't get meaningful work placement, they don't achieve in a lot of the qualifications that, that we're delivering. And there's quite a, a high level of scrutiny on those placements now as well, more so than ever. Um, with the T-level provision and the employer set projects. So we've absolutely had to invest in that. We've invested a lot of money in those teams. Um, some of that money was government funded, which was really helpful, but we've had to embed that in our strategy now because that, that's going next year with the capacity development funding. Um, so we've had to really embed that, that model. Um, the, the second thing I think that's, that's been really um, positive for us is we've revamped, revamped our employer forums, so every single curriculum area has a core group of employers. Um, that's been fantastic for inspiring students. Students, uh, about two thirds of our students from, from Middlesbrough come from deprived areas. It's really important that they see people from those areas who've went to, you know, into those businesses, been successful in those careers. And I think your point um, on that career's guidance, Iman, is, I was thinking there, you know, when you were talking, the employer careers guidance is just as important as the careers mm -hmm. tutor guidance and getting those employers to really give that in-depth knowledge because, you know, we sit in a new mayoral de uh, development corporation. We've got Teesworks, which is sort of the, the, the new national hub for net zero energy and all those technologies. There's nobody better than the employer to be able to tell our students what those emerging industries are and then I was matching that curriculum to it. So um, those knowledge, skills, behaviours. So I don't just want to be an engineer. I want to do this. And, this is ex and that's what we work to throughout the learner journey. That's fantastic. And really good to hear that kind of uptick in employer engagement. I think even as a very small employer, it comes across so well when an education institution is kind of joined up and you get that kind of point of contact. I'm sure you'd agree as well as a larger employer. Like it just feels so professional. And I'm not surprised that's um, had a really, really positive impact. Um, we're going to go from the, from the strategic level down to the front line, Iman, and come back to you just to tell us a little bit about the kind of workplace experiences you've had at Global and how those have influenced you thinking about your future. Um, some of the work experiences that I've had, I've been able to like work on like different events. So um, I think my most recent one, during like near Christmas, I worked on the Capital Jingle Bell Ball. And so we have loads of artists come and perform and I was more working like backstage with the artists, you know, when they were doing their interviews, which was, you know, really insightful because, you know, it really shows you that there, no matter what field you go in, there is always a role for what it is that you want to do, no matter how big or small that it is. And any interest can turn into a career. Um, it's just about finding your interest because like you can have you could be interested in anything and think, oh, well, I can't make a career out of it because I've never heard of it before. But it's up to you to create it. And I feel like that's what work experience really does. It allows you to discover what it is most that you want to do. And it shows you different pathways and avenues into turning it into something. So that's what I think I really value the most about work experience. That's fantastic. Thank you, Iman. And we were talking earlier about how the, the school that you happen to go to is quite kind of yeah. sector focused. And, and do you want to say a little bit about how that's yeah. helped to uh, shape you as well? So the UTC that I go to, as I said earlier, it you know, really focuses on media. And so because of that, you, you have the most amount of time to really hone your skills and like discover what it is that you want to do during that in, like in that industry because it is so vast. And I feel like it's really important that we have those kind of institutions that, you know, specialize in a certain topic that is so broad because it allows young people to like have a safe place to go if it is that they want to you know learn something because I know that going other colleges near where I live they have the same course that I do but I know that if I had gone there instead of where I go now it wouldn't be the same quality because 
they have so many other subjects that they offer as well. So they have to spread their resources out to other subjects rather than just focusing on one point. Thanks, Iman. I think the, the other point I kind of mentioned there, I think, is um, it's lovely to see when schools and colleges kind of use a particular sector as the lens through which to yeah. kind of bring subjects to life. Um, so even if all the students are going to go into that particular subject, it really shows them how everything kind of yeah. connects to the, to the real world. Um, I just had a bit of a like a flash forward in my mind to a clip show in like 10 years time when you're a TV presenter yeah. and they'd play a clip of this and I'll be on TV <laughs> saying like this is where she came from. So yeah. thanks in advance for that. And I'm it's OK. <laughs> Vinette, maybe we could stay with this really positive theme and you could say a little bit about how you've seen some of your students uh, kind of benefit from those experiences of work and how they've shaped them to kind of think about their future careers. I think for um, my students, because when I started the post last September, I think there was a lot, there was nobody in post, so um, careers kind of flagged a bit. So in I come with my exuberance, so they were a little bit overwhelmed, like, whoa, can you slow down a bit for me, because there's too much coming at me. So one of the things we um, did was to actually... Um, get more people in and get people with practical experiences because our kids will not, even though they tap into the virtual, they quite like to see people in front of them. And at University of Buckingham was quite good because we were having a debate about AI and they had uh, the robot dog spot. And I didn't even tell them, I just tell them they were going to do a lecture. And for those people who decided to miss the lecture, they were so surprised when they saw this robotic dog walk in. So everybody actually descended to see what is happening, what is happening, can we get a part of that bit? And I think for my kids, it's just piquing their interest first, even if it's a career field that they have never, ever thought about. It's just getting something that gets them excited, get a hook in. And what we find is that kids are actually asking questions about career. Um, I was going on the corridor, and the kid asked me about a UX designer. And of course, I bluffed it like I knew what it was from everything. I had no idea. But I had I had to go and just do a little bit of research to make sure the next time they ask me, I have that information for them. And it's changing their perspective. That's what I like more than anything, changing their mindset so they're not afraid of asking people about um, their careers. We had one day where I did some very big badges to say, ask me about my career. And just to ask the teachers, because they just think that you're born a teacher and you don't do anything else, you're just in there. And it's just opening the door that one teacher was an ear hostess and she was shocked because she could not believe that a teacher was a ear hostess before. So just enjoying the career journey and just showing the different points. Um, in year seven, when they start out, which is the first year seven this year, I gave them this little GPS map, which is their career guidance. And basically we lose the G for the goal. Where do you want to go? What career do you want to be? Do you want to be a doctor? You make sure you can stand the sight of blood, that type of thing. I can give them guidance <laughs> there. So they put their little goal, and I told them it doesn't have to be a fixed goal. It's just something that you're working towards. Then you have the P. Let's look at the position. Where are we relative to that bit? Is it possible? What are the rules that are available? So we look at the position where they are now, and then we say, okay, let's get started. Now, you might find when we revisited that they had a year eight, they thought, don't like maths. I don't think I can do that bit. And I'm like, that's okay. If you have a GPS and you're heading up the M1 and there's a roadblock, you don't stop in life, do you? You find a divergent path. So let's go somewhere else. And so we just draw in another path and they start another path, still getting to different goals. But it's just actually making a little bit of real life experiences. And so they're a little bit more positive and open to the different career path and learning and making those choices. I love that idea of the different routes and I think um, bluffing and then going and doing some quick research yeah. is definitely one of those skills of that um, I think for every different career like <laughs> uh, that one definitely should be should be on the curriculum um, Karen you said a little bit about some of the benefits you've already seen uh, as an employer and obviously different employers are, are kind of engaged in this to a different extent so maybe to employers who are not yet kind of where you are what would you say in terms of some of the benefits you've seen as an organization for getting this engaged in, in kind of workplace experiences um, can I just mention something on that first? Of course, I, yeah. I also just wanted to mention that there are so many careers available, it's impossible to expose young people to all of them. So I just wanted to set that expectation. I don't think anybody on this earth understands all the different career opportunities that are available because there's just too many of them. So I just want to set an expectation on that. So the focus is in what are your skills, what do you enjoy doing? Do you like being creative? Do you like number crunching? Do you like project managing? Do you like engaging with people? Really just hone on what you enjoy doing. And then the other thing I wanted to say, it's never too late to change path, which is following on from what you say. Mm. If you don't know when you're at school, sorry, I know you're not at school, but if your pupils <laughs> don't know when they're not at school, it's not the end of the world. You can change path, you can change routes. Um, I know my sister retrained when she was 40. So 
I just wanted to kind of re uh, make sure that young people don't panic if they don't know. I'm a mum, I have two sons. My eldest son always knew what he wanted to do. He built a computer when he was 12. Technology was his thing. He's a software developer. That's what he's done. He's followed his path. My younger son was fantastic at everything. He had no idea what he wanted to do. And to be honest, he fell out of further education. He lost his way. He's now a chef. They're doing completely some, something completely different. And he actually used to love just cooking when he was younger. So but he could apply. He could have been an actor. He could have done anything. So I just wanted to sort of position that don't set expectations. You're ever going to be able to expose young people to every career. Because I couldn't tell you what all the careers are. I don't think anybody could or any employer could. So that's just one thing. So sorry. Your question was um, <laughs> coming back to benefits for us. Well, one thing I just wanted to mention, I've touched on it a little bit. But first of all, for us as an organization, and this will be true of most organisations, um, it's your brand. You know, if you're working with young people, um, you're actually having an impact on their lives. You're actually helping your employer brand. And for TfL, the, as we're here to serve the public, young people are also our customers. Um, and so it's important to understand and engage with young people um, to make sure we're delivering the right transport network for them as well. So there's something about the brand. Um, but, but more importantly than that, you know, young people is our future. If we don't invest in young people and support them and help them, they're going to be the future of careers, of direction of travel of the workplace. So there's just a social responsibility that we have to do this as employers as well. And I know that people that work for TfL really feel passionate about that as well. They do feel that social responsibility. Um, and actually, it has an impact on their engagement working for us. If they can actually do something that's giving back to society, that's helping young people, they feel more connected to TfL because they, they're unable to do that at TfL, and it actually has a positive impact on their engagement in the workplace. And then finally, really important, is actually an embedded part of our talent strategy. Um, by our people supporting young people, whether it might be hosting them when they come into the workplace, whether it might be going in and doing a lesson plan, whether it might be designing a project or helping the support in doing some innovations and applying their knowledge to a project, for example, that's relevant to the workplace, it actually develops their skills as well. And a lot of people in our organisation that perhaps want to become a leader, they might choose to sponsor, host a young person because it's the first step on their journey to become a leader. And the skills that they develop in their own personal development, because trust me, you never stop learning, ever stop learning. Um, and so it really is an embedded part of our talent strategy that we actually say this is an intervention. If you want to develop your leadership skills or if you want to develop presentation skills, have you thought about going out and doing a school presentation? Have you thought about being a STEM ambassador? Have you thought about hosting a young person in work experience? Um, so it's actually an embedded part of our talent strategy as well for our own people's personal development. I love that. Thank you so much. And, and Alice, obviously, you, you'll spend time talking to your lead employers across the trust. What, what are some of the other benefits that they give you and what are the arguments that you make to kind of get them more heavily involved? Yeah, I think it's almost this, this, this carbon copy of this, that, that conversation that um, you know, so, so many of our employers, and, and we're based in Lincolnshire, so we have a bit of a microclimate in terms of the economy and lots of SMEs, but the challenges that we have time and time again are talent retention, um, you know, skills um, that, that young people are coming into their businesses with, that, that there are other things that the employers wanted to have. Um, so it, it, it's appealing to those strategic challenges that employers are having in our local labour market. Um, if, if they are struggling with certain skills, how can we inform our curriculums at Key Stage 3, Key Stage 4 to make sure that we're being preventative, not reactive when, when they go into, into the world of work? Um, I think yeah, t talent retention and, and talent recruitment is, is one of the, the real key priorities for, for our local employers. Um, you know, this, this age-old conversation about we're really struggling to recruit in this sector or in this role. Um, actually, you know, working with our Year 10 students, they could only be two years away from entering that labour market. So it's that, that sort of opening employers' eyes into that forward-thinking view around these students, actually, yes, they're 14 or younger, it won't be long before they are looking for, to, to enter the world of work. Um, and it is then for us being able to articulate that to our students. So, so that, that brand exposure for our businesses is how we then use that across the trust to make sure that that message is relayed um, to, to our students. So if we do have a certain type of sector 
who is wanting to recruit in a certain area, making sure that we're very transparent to our students about how we can support them through that, whether it's through an apprenticeship, whether it's through the local FE college, whether it's through one of our sixth form courses, how do we get them into that, that, that sector and, and onto that journey? But again, using that message that if they want to change their minds, we'll give you the skills to make sure that you can do that. Amazing. We're going to finish this little section by just, uh, again, on a positive note, thinking about what the kind of critical success factors are in this space. So, Ben, maybe if I can come to you first and just tell us a little bit about you know, what, what makes this really work, what makes this take in Middlesbrough College. Yeah, and again, picking up on, on what Ellis was saying there, I think we've spent a lot of time working with employers, almost educating them on what employer interactions are and the value of them. So there's a, typical, there's a traditional sort of work experience, isn't there, that employers <coughs> think, well, I can't do that, you know, it's time intensive. So what we track is interactions and we've been engaging with employees and saying there's a whole host of things you can do, you know, that don't involve that huge amount of time that build up over time and really help shape that, that young person's career. Um, for us um, at, at Middlesbrough, um, we really have... A few things, I think regularity of contact uh, is one, you know, really building up those strong relationships with employers so they really do see the college as a talent bank of individuals and the answer to their workforce, you know, development issues that they're having, especially in a lot of the emerging sectors that we're seeing, you know, no, coming, coming to light in the Tees Valley. Um, one of the things that we found really beneficial is we have an institute of technology around digital um, skills. Uh, we opened that up as a separate building. As part of that opening up, the employers helped design that building. The employers helped map the curriculum to the um, needs of, of the local sector. And they actually sponsor a room. So at the point around visibility, there's about 15 rooms in there. We have 15 um, businesses, SMEs, who sponsor those rooms. As part of that, there's an understanding that employers are going to engage in the curriculum design. They're going to engage in you know, guiding the students, they're going to provide work placements. That's been something that we found really positive. And that sort of um, dual positive relationship with the employer where they actually say, you know, we've met students, the students are attending the employer forums, presenting to them about the things they're learning. And I think that two-way interaction, regular contact and the sponsorship of those rooms and just visibility of those employers, the big employers, really open the students' eyes up to the opportunities available to them and really help inspire them to, to, to work hard and move into those careers that they, they want to go down. That's fantastic, Ben. And, and Vinette, tell us a little bit about kind of critical success factors from your perspective. Um, I think for me, it's just establishing that um, connection between the employers, the kids, and of course, uh, just to make sure we are supplying the workforce that we have. Um, I think the difficulty that I have in my area is that we don't really have a lot of placements for the kids. Try as we may, we have about 120 in the cohort. There's no way I'm getting 120 students out into the workforce. And that's a real challenge for most careers leaders is getting that at the same time. Because what you find, um, there are about six schools near to me and all of us tend to do work experience within very close timing. So you'll go to one place and like, oh, I have students from that place, I have students from that place. I got one call this morning, unfortunately, that school has come in before you. And it's a real challenge for me in terms of getting those students and getting those positive um, experience for the students going out. Um, so it's, it, it's, for me, is planning ahead, because you know that that's a potential barrier coming up. Uh, when we started in September, we literally had um, 30 students for November placement without any placements whatsoever, and they needed to have, have that work experience. So we had to just put our heads together and actually create something for them to make sure they are not missing out. And it has been said repeatedly, just focusing on the skill set that they need to develop, because even if they're not in a workplace, they can actually develop that skill set. And even if workplace cannot accommodate them for placement, they don't mind sometimes contributing an hour to come into school and actually give them a talk and give them an experience of what is happening. Um, so what we opted for was like a project-based work experience within school, which means that we, we were trying to design a room and we got, as long as you didn't break anything or not on the structures, you could actually do a lot of things in. And the principal is quite, quite open to that. So what we had were people coming in to look at the financial bits, to sort that bit out. We had somebody coming in for interior designing, talking through the processes, looking at space, looking at color. We had somebody come for entrepreneurship. So we had quite a lot of people coming in from legalist perspective. So they did get an experience of the workplace, even though they were not out um, in full force. So we always make sure we capitalize on all the different experiences to make sure our students are accessing different experiences of, of the workplace in any format. 
That's great, Vinat. So as if this panel wasn't good enough value for you, we've got a couple of extra contributions from colleagues who are with us in the room. So I'd like to welcome Simon Wareham first from Southmore Academy to give us a couple of minutes thinking about um, how really good experience of work can address young people not in education, employment or training. Um, Simon. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, it's brilliant to be here. Um, as Ollie said, my name is Simon Wareham. I'm assistant head teacher of a student progression uh, at Southmore Academy in Sunderland. So I look after everything to do with personal development and um, careers and all of that rolled together in one. I'm up there in Sunderland. I'm in my fifth year of, um, as a careers leader now, so I've seen it all the way through. I was the only careers leader established in our school, so I've seen it all the way through since the start. And when you think of Sunderland first, well, the first thing you probably think about is the football team. Um, difficult for me as a Newcastle supporter to work in Sunderland, but at the same time, think of that first. But actually, Sunderland is a massively growing city. It's amazing what they're doing up there in Sunderland right now. Um, it's, believe it or not, it's going to be called a smart city is what it's going to be called eventually. It's going to all broadband across the city and all of that. So it's a real growing area, but that equally there are massive areas of social deprivation. Huge areas, particularly for coastal areas that we are in, and our school is very much in the coast. You go to the top floor, and you can see the sea right from the top floor of the school. So we're in those kind of key areas just there. So one of the things that we've been working on is really trying to break down those barriers and we try and support our students to go out there into the workplace and be able to thrive when they get out there, but also to see what's out there, but also supporting the city as well at the same time to try and generate that, that next generation um, of, of workers. And one of the things that we're really proud about as a school is for the first time last year, um, our year 11s, 100% of them were in education, employment and training. That was 240 year 11 students. We had a zero neat figure, which has never, ever happened before in the school. But it does show the strength of the career strategy that we've got in place and that engagement with employers that we've put in. The impact is really strong there to see it. And one of the turning points that we had at the school really was, and it comments on what the, the panel have said this morning, one of the big turning points that we had is um, we looked at the fact that students were getting great exam results and they were you know, coming out with rafts of grade sevens and eights and things like that. But actually, they couldn't talk to an employer. They didn't know how to do that. They could have been the most clever student ever, but they didn't know how to talk to an employer, how to engage, what skills they need to have. So that marked a massive turning point for us to turn it around and actually say, getting exam results is only kind of half the job. We've still got the other half to do as well. We've still got that second half, and both parts must come together in order to produce that next generation of young person that's going out into the workplace, including the skills massive. So we put a huge emphasis on skills, which I'll talk about in a second. One of the things that we've really worked strong with is working with our enterprise advisor. And we have a fantastic enterprise advisor who works for an apprenticeship training provider. Her contacts, her address book is unlimited. So therefore, if I want somebody about something to come in and talk to students, yep, I've got someone, I'll send them straight in the next day, and here they come. So we set up a careers um, database, an, an employer database, where um, she hands out cards when she goes for meetings, and it gets a little QR code on it, and they can click onto it, sign up, and then their name appears on our database in school, but they can choose what they want to do to help the school with. So if they want to provide workplace encounters, they can tick that box just there, and we've got it just there. So that works really well, and that's really helped us. A couple of examples of where we've worked with employers. Um, for example, um, PwC is a very big employer that we've worked with quite a bit, and we have taken students in year nine out to visit PwC quite a few times. And that's really translated itself into helping students in the future think about where they want to go. So one, um, we went back in March, and one young man um, was asked by one of the employers, can you sell, keep yourself working in a place like this, an amazing office with glass windows overlooking the River Tyne? And all of that, he said, no, I can't see myself working here at all. Can't see myself doing this. Uh, I'm not good enough to do that. Well, we want to try and support the students to make sure actually they are good enough to do that, and they can get in places like that when they go on. And the proof of that is one of our year 13s has just been taken on as a PwC apprentice, so we've seen it all the way through. Uh, going through just there. And I know the panel mentioned quite a bit about um, skills and, um, and building on that. We ran a very innovative work experience program for two years where students were going out, a bit like what Ollie said at the start, where they're going out one afternoon a week on a Wednesday, our year 10s were going out. We've had to postpone it just slightly at the minute and we're getting back into it again, but that really helped them. And what it really helped them with, it's interesting what the panel have said, it wasn't about whether that was the right workplace for them to go to. It was about developing the skills they needed in the workplace in order to get ready. So developing those listening skills, speaking skills, um, teamwork skills, those of you will recognize those eight skills, because those are the skills builder skills that we've got thoroughly embedded in our school. Um, so they're building on those and developing them further. And for us, that is the most important thing. Yes, they might have an idea about what they want to do. They might have an idea of where they're going to go next. 
but they might not know it exactly. And there's so many jobs out there, as Karen mentioned, things that we don't even know that are coming up in the future. And it's about preparing those people, uh, those young people going further forward. So skills for us is, is really important. And an example, just one last example, a pull, pill out of that. Um, apprenticeships has always been very low for us as a sixth form going on in year 13. Normally it's about 2-3% going to apprenticeships. Through all of this that we've done, including the extended work placements that they did, because the last year's year 13 were the first year group to do that back in year 10, the figure shot up to 13% going off to do apprenticeships. So therefore that contact with the workplace has been absolutely vital and has really helped there. So a few examples, I could go on longer, but a few examples there of what we've done um, in our school. Thank you so much, Simon. And let's welcome Alex from Arthur Terry School. Alex. Thank you very much. Um, fantastic to be here. Privileged to be here amongst uh, you guys all today. Um, from the Arthur Terry School, as you said, AT part of ATLP in Birmingham. So a uh, fun journey down to London this morning. Um, so I'm taking a slightly different angle. Uh, Vinette, you were just mentioning earlier um, about experiences of the workplace. And I think that's where I want to take the conversation a little bit, away from workplace experience, which sounds to me a little bit too much like typical uh, you know, work experience. Because you're right, we have 280 students in our year groups, and it's very difficult to get them those really meaningful uh, impacts within uh, the actual workplace. Uh, though we, we do do that in the hybrid ways that many of you were mentioning earlier. So um, we do also do constant bridging between the worlds of work and the world of school all the time, so that students really understand that what they're doing in the, work, in the school uh, context has meaning for the workplace and, and vice versa. I mean, we had this uh, on Monday, we had DHL working with our pupil premium students. We have a very strong core offer for all our students. We also have something called the vulnerable first approach, which is every student who's vulnerable, whether it's a looked after child, pupil premium student, send student, uh, a child perhaps or someone in the armed services, anyone who's uh, sort of within that vulnerable list, they get additional contact with employers every single year, year seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, through to 13, if they stay to our sixth form. So that additional support we find is really, really crucial to close that gap um, so just one one quick experience I've been asked to, to showcase today and it's one of our year 12 experiences and it's called application ready so whether we also have lots of uh, students going on to do degree apprenticeships or higher level uh, apprenticeships alongside university routes and whichever route they're kind of aiming aiming for in, in that kind of key stage five context uh, they need the skills to actually apply and so what we do is we have something called application ready. And what we do, we have um, the students, this was designed in conjunction and alongside uh, employers, which is really important. Something that like you were saying, so developing the curriculum alongside the employer. So doing that in conjunction really helped. So they start with a Capfinity strengths profile. Capfinity is a big brand that do proper strength profile, not a sort of a piecemeal one. They work with major employers in the UK, and so why shouldn't the students have the same quality of strength profiling? So we start with that. They do that prior to this special day, a drop-down day for year 12. And then there's, a first of all, an industry-led uh, workshop reflecting on their results on that, so making it sort of meaningful. The students then uh, practice a range of competency tests. They can be an immediate barrier to an application. If you haven't practiced in advance some of those competency tests, and they can all be practiced, they're very daunting at first, so they, they try the range of those. They also then work on using their mobile phones and unseen questions, video interviewing techniques, really important because it's another barrier or obstacle to getting through to the next stage, so you prepare them for that. And then, of course, the UCAS as well also is going that way in terms of the digital uh, conversation rather than your standard thing. And then we finish off with a, a genuine centre ass assessment experience. So pret manger their real centre ass assessment experience that they use, we use the same one as they do in their industry. So we have the employers coming out, like you said, an army of them. Actually, we have two at least two per small group of 12 key stage students. So really close contact. We, have a, we had an event recently, we had 100 uh, profession, uh, employers in, in on one day. Uh, over two, 200 employers, uh, employees on the day there, which was great. So they do a centre center experience from Pret-a-Manger, they work collaboratively, and then those same mentors turn into the dragons or the sharks at the end of the day. So good experiences, and you have a range of those throughout um, our, our programme, so three of those across the whole key stages. But uh, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Simon. Alex, really helpful to get the extra examples. So we've got time for a couple of questions. Uh, as it's a hybrid event, I'm going to go for one in the room first, and then we're going to come to, uh, to have one from online. So who'd like to ask a question in the room? <coughs> Fantastic. Yeah, just say who you are, this lady here in the white top. Um, Shout. Microphone's coming so that we can uh, get it for our online colleagues as well. Hi, good morning. Uh, Sharon Blyfield from Coca-Cola. It's been really, really interesting. But one question, I guess, for the education establishments, and, and Vanette, you, you mentioned this, 
that a lot of schools come all at the same time for their work experience, <laughs> yet we have a whole academic year to do that. Is there something that can be changed or amended so that actually it is filtered rather than all at once? Great question. It's something we hear a lot from employers. Uh, Vanette, as the uh, part of the education establishment there, <laughs> do you want to come back and, and give a perspective on that? I think that's a big plus for um, things like multi-academy trust because really schools do not need to work competitively. They need to work cooperatively. And since we're accessing the same <coughs> workplaces, my proposition, that's what I said to my head teacher, is actually tapping in with the other career leaders in our region. And I think SEMLEP, which is the eastern region I belong to, they're actually doing that where they have these hub meetings. And what we're trying to do is making sure we're discussing and planning together because we're serving the same area and see if we can actually look at rotating that. So if they're doing it in the summer term, then somebody else will pick up on that. So that's one of the things that we have done in our local careers hub is just to make sure we know what each other is doing and make sure it's complementary and not competitive so we can support the same young people going forward. Yeah, I love that point. Collaboration through the careers hub, collaboration through multi-academy trusts. Alice, have you got a perspective on that one? Yeah, I'd, 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 two things. I'd, I'd say the same. I think collaborating through the careers hub, work with enterprise coordinators. I think generating that culture in the careers hub that a student, for us, a student in Lincoln is a Lincoln student no matter which establishment they belong to. So the experience of the workplace is, is for Lincoln and the benefit of our local economy, not just for, our, for students in our trust. Um, and the second thing I'd add is, is a, the key pillar of our strategy is the workplace visitors model. So moving away from the, 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 the generic or you know, historic one week placement, two week placement, but moving towards these workplace visits. I think that's the opportunity where we can really stagger them through an academic year. Um, as, as schools, the summer term is always going to be our best time for, for, for getting students out on placement. But we've certainly we, we, we've tried to, to adapt to that this year. We've had two weeks in, in March this year where students did go on placement. Ironically, that's the end of year period for business, so that was a nightmare for them. Um, so, so it didn't, didn't necessarily work, but, but we, we learned. But yeah, the workplace visits, we, we can start that from September and run all the way through to July. And I think adapting that model and encouraging businesses to be open to that model as well, which, which we found that they are because there is a, a less time investment. They can really invest resources into one day or a few hours. That, that reduces that burden and pressure on the local economy to host 20, 25 schools on one-week placements. Fantastic. And Ben, do you want to come back on that from a FE perspective? Yeah, I mean, we, we have round about 4,500 16 to 18-year-olds at Middlesbrough um, the curriculum departments run quite independently. Uh, some of the feedback we've had for you know, 16 to 18 year olds going out on placement is a lot of employers would rather have a block than the day a week. That's just something we're picking up because of the range of experience they can get within that week, seeing the organisation run in full rather than the same thing you know, every single day, which was, was quite interesting. Um, because of the way our curriculum's structured, they don't all tend to go out in the same time. And we have placements where we have a cohort one going out, say, for T-level engineering, and then the same employers host another cohort sort of later on. I think that the point is a really good one, though, because we are sort of early adopters of some of the new curriculum in, in quite high numbers. We know when some of our uh, colleagues within the Tees Valley are also delivering those qualifications, that's definitely going to become a bigger issue when we're all going for the same placements. Then we have Teesside University wanting all the nursing placements. We have T-level nursing. It's certainly something we're going to have to pay really careful attention to in the strategy moving forward. Fantastic. Thank you, Ben. And, and obviously, there are some really good intermediary organisations out there, things like education business partnerships. Uh, one of the things we've done at EDGE recently is looked back at some of the innovations from the past. So um, looked back at kind of when EBPs were in every area. So there's lots of lessons from kind of previous attempts to coordinate things better as well that hopefully we can, we can make use of. Uh, we're going to come to our lovely online audience next. And one of my lovely colleagues from CEC is going to read out a question from online. Great. Thank you, Ollie. Um, so we've had lots of chatter online about hybrid and the fact that obviously during the pandemic, a lot of virtual experiences were offered and people are interested to know the value of maintaining hybrid approaches and how they can be meaningful. Uh, so, yeah, putting that out to the panel. Fantastic. Who'd like to come back on that one first? Karen, you caught my eye first. Go for it. <laughs> um, so... Um, Okay, so I'm going to translate this to what actually happens in the workplace and then how you can translate that to helping young people experience that as well. Um, so we do have hybrid meetings in the workplace now. It's very rare that you have a meeting um, that is 
purely in person, very rare. It's usually hybrid. And there's an art to A, facilitating, which you've done brilliantly, I have to say, this morning, facilitating a hybrid session to make sure that those that are remote feel connected and that they're involved in the discussion and they feel um, they're, not, they're not forgotten. So that's, that's the first thing. And it's developing those skills. You can also, with hybrid, do breakout rooms. I mean, I run a hybrid meeting with my team once every four weeks. Um, and some people are in the room and some people are... Um, virtually dialed in and I make sure that I connect everybody I bring all of the audiences together and then I might go off and do breakout discussions the people then break off in smaller groups and, and discuss things so I think if we can reenact that for virtual work experience or experience as work I should say where you could set them a little project to do a little exercise to do go and debate something with with other fellow students or to be facilitated in that room with um, somebody from the workplace um, and you can reenact that and bring that to life. But it is reality of the workplace now, as I say, not for those careers that have to be front of house and facing off to the customers um, or operational roles. But for most office-based roles, that is the life of work now. So we do need to um, bring that to life for young people as well. I don't know if that That's really answers. helpful. I'll be putting that bit of feedback straight on my LinkedIn profile, so thank you very much. Um, Iman, have any of your experiences featured a virtual element? And if um, not, would you be up for that being part of your experience? Loads. We work very virtually where I go. Um, a lot of the work that we do in the building, we can also do at home, even though it is mandatory to come in. Um, if we are working on projects or, you know, are working with, like, outside companies with our school, we tend to have online like zoom meetings and i remember during lockdown especially we had to really come to grips with using online you know facilities and i feel like initially it was very challenging because it's like you know you've never used it before you don't know how it's going to work out it felt very you know impersonal in the beginning but then i mean i guess as you know teachers and students you know you all become very familiar with it quite quickly because that's how we was living for quite a long time you kind of rebuild your connection with your teachers via online and so I feel like it's really useful to be able to use you know online facilities to talk to your teachers because you know there's a lot of difficulty getting into the office or getting into school nowadays with a lot of strikes and things like that so I feel like it just adds another level of accessibility for classes and meetings so I think it's very beneficial. That's brilliant and, and a perfect example of how that experience would then translate specifically if you went to work yeah. for Karen you know you'd be in virtual meetings so a direct read across. Um, Ellis you mentioned the kind of quite tight labour market around where you are have you made use of virtual to kind of broaden the opportunities for young people in Lincoln? Yeah yeah so so virtual has a place in our model um, we, we, we still use that as, as one of the mechanisms um, we I often use the example for us it, it, it's about the purpose of the placement, I suppose. When, when we look at virtual, we, you know, we, we do like the, the in-person model, but there are certain placements, like Karen, you were saying, that, that virtual is, is the mechanism by which that industry works or, or by how we access that placement. So um, the, the example I often use is if we have students who want to work in a Magic Circle law firm, we don't have Magic Circle law firms in Lincolnshire. Um, so the only way of accessing that placement is often through virtual means. That for us is far more impactful for that student than placing them with auntie or uncle in an industry that they, they don't want to work in. We know they still benefit from that placement, but we'd much rather place them somewhere they're going to get that, that meaningful impact. So, so virtual just have a place for, for us in our, in our strategy. We just really want to understand it. As it, it I suppose protecting the integrity of our program is, is why do they want to do the virtual placement and really understanding what, again, the impact will be, what the intent is. And if, we've, if we're clear about that, then, then yeah, we, we will support it moving forward as well. Fantastic. Thank you. I think we've got time for one more question from online. A question, oh, a question from um, the online audience around. Um, we had conversations earlier about supporting uh, young people with additional needs from um, Vanette's perspective. But are there any other innovative approaches to supporting people who may be facing barriers to entering the workforce um, with their experiences of the workplace? Fantastic. Thank you. You'd like to come back on that one first, Ben? Yep. Perfect. Yeah. Absolutely. We um, have sort of blessed to have really in their free college quite a lot of industry spec equipment so we do a lot of in-house placement for those students so it's a staged approach 
So again, I think it's, it's a lot to do with that preparatory work you do beforehand. But we find that certainly for some of the um, entry level one students, some of the students who have a particular learning need, that internal work placement, sometimes within the same site, sometimes at a different site, that's, if you have that opportunity to do so, I think that's, that's really meaningful. The student you know, really feels like they're going elsewhere, so they might go over to and the sixth form building and work with one of the IT techs who work in that building rather than on the main street. That's just something we've, we've deployed that sounds quite simple but has been quite effective um, where, we've, where it's been deployed properly. Fantastic stage approach, building confidence. Um, anyone else like to come back on that? Karen? Um, yeah, so I, a couple of things I mentioned. So um, what we try to do within Transport for London is we don't prevent any of our people across the organisation in creating workplace experiences for their contacts and people they know. But what we tend to do within our central team is focus the opportunities on those people who do have barriers. So exactly for those people who don't have access to those opportunities, that's what we would do centrally, is to make sure that those opportunities are equally available to those that might not have parents or opportunities available to them through um, their upbringing or whatever, whatever barrier they might have. And, and the second thing I wanted to mention is we also do what we call employability programmes for people with barriers into the workplace. Um, so we, we do that depending how far away they are from work ready and where they are in their journey. <laughs> there we are, got a pen there on well transport. Um, so... Um, one, one example of that, one of the programs we run is for those that, who have got very limited or no coming from education into work. And it's those that, for exactly that reason, might have barriers. We give an enhanced program to them that might be a 12-week program that gives them more immersive experience to build their confidence, build their skills. And we work, again, in partnership with a third party. Um, and we actually design that program often around where we've actually got jobs for them at the end. So we, we, we pipeline them into roles within the organisation. Excellent, thank you. We've got time for one more in the can room. I just jump on the oh, of course you can, and then we'll um, come. I think one of the things I've explored recently with the barriers looking at um, getting into the workplace is the challenge for us is that we took quite a lot of Ukrainian kids in over their homes so are Ukrainian, and quite a lot of them cannot access English, and that's a major barrier this week, actually getting them out into the workplace. So that's one of the challenges we have, but what we have tapped into is a virtual experience, which is making it useful because they can actually do it overseas. They don't have to be limited here. So we've actually had one company onboarding which is a French company and literally it's in school so we're there to support to make sure the quality of the integrity is maintained but that is just one bar overcoming just tying into what the reality is right now with those virtual um, work experiences so it's just finding the barriers and finding solutions that's just always my focus get the solutions brilliant well a lovely and relevant example thank you for that uh, let's come back for, to the room for one final I think um, did you have your hand up earlier oh, or, oh, amazing <laughs> consensus on the questions just on the end here thank you very much Thank you. Um, I'm Katie Tibbles. I'm from Turner Schools, which is a small multi-academy trust down uh, in the southeast corner. Um, my question really is for Karen. Um, I think what you are doing is absolutely incredible, um, and I feel like you're every school's dream. Um, unfortunately, where we're based geographically, we have high levels of disadvantage, um, pupils in the school, fewer opportunities, much like Ellis is saying. Um, but how can we as schools influence the employers and organisations that we do have locally? How can we influence them to, I guess, have the same belief and passion that you have for developing young people and, and getting involved? How can we, we speak their language, I guess, is the question I'm asking. I'm very happy to come and talk to them if you want, if that helps. <laughs> um, but I, I would say it's tapping into what benefit they're going to get out of it. So I think if you spin it like I, like I talked about earlier on the value they'll get as an organisation around how it will develop their own people and how they can actually get some gain out of it um, and also have an influence on making sure the skills that young people are developing are the skills that they want as an employer. So when they come into the workplace, they've got a pipeline of resource there that's going to be relevant for their industry and relevant for their, for their organisation. I think if you can spin it that way, um, then it's going to be some gain for them. Um, people don't always see that from that angle in terms of, I'm just doing this because it's helping the young people or it's helping the school, or it's a legal requirement they've got to come and do this work experience. Um, whereas actually it's them, well, what are they going to gain out of it as an organisation? So it's finding what's going to be a benefit for them as an organisation. And I can't understate the value we get in the development we see in our people by working with young people. And when I talk to some of our STEM ambassadors and some of the fantastic people we got that do engage with young people, and they talk so passionately about 
how it's helped them personally. I can think of one individual who talked about they were actually quite shy and didn't like presenting and didn't have the confidence to present. And actually by working as a STEM ambassador, they got used to going out and presenting to, to a classroom of children, whether that be virtually or in person. And it really developed their presentation skills and actually presenting in front of, as I'm sure you all know, a group of young people is probably a lot more challenging than presenting in front of some adults. So it really develops their skills, so I tap into that. But, and, and also, you know, very, help, very happy for you to ever join any kind of virtual stuff that we do that will still give those young people in your area access to an insight to the workplace. Um, just because we're in London doesn't mean to say that we can't reach out to wider areas. So very happy for you to get involved with that. Thank you for that very generous response, Karen. So we're coming to the end of our time together, sadly. So can I just ask everyone for a big round of applause? Feel free to clap at your computer screen at home uh, for our five great panellists and our two bonus speakers as well. Um, I just wanted to share a few messages that I think have really cut across that for, for me. I think the first one was really just the importance of those human connections. So building those relationships, whether that is the relationship between the careers advisor and the young person, really understanding that, as Imam was saying, or that deep relationship between the, the kind of institution um, and, and the employer, as all three of our educationalists have, have mentioned, um, and, and uh, helping to kind of have that human element. So your example, Vinette, of kind of the young person going into a supermarket and kind of having that extra time just to get used to it, just having that kind of understanding that that would help um, kind of re really can make a difference. Um, I think the second one that's really stood out for me is that that point about the kind of the win-win for the employer and you've spoken really richly about that Karen but not being afraid of talking about that from both perspectives like there's something in this for the employer not just the longer term talent pipeline which is really important but actually shorter term giving your aspiring leaders the opportunity to manage someone giving people the opportunity to present and develop their skills uh, and kind of making sure that that is uh, front and center of our conversations can really help to to bring them on board and, and obviously Ben's team and analysis kind of bringing those employers on board, kind of using those arguments every day. Um, and finally, Vinette, your kind of point about the GPS, I really like that, the idea that we've got kind of, we're helping people to set those goals. There are different ways, but you know, we do come across blockages uh, and, we, and we have to kind of understand the way around them. That's just part of life. It's not that the work experience was the wrong place. Uh, it, learnt, learnt, it, it kind of helped you learn something, whether that's something as dramatic as falling on the floor and fainting, uh, or whether it's kind of a subtler lesson. Uh, all of that helps to kind of build up where we're going to get to. So um, huge thanks to everyone. And I'm just gonna pass to Nicola from the Chris Enterprise Company to close the session for today. Thanks, Ollie, and thanks to all of our panel for joining us today with your um, rich insight into this piece of work. Now, it always falls to me to think about what's next in, in the context of any of our semina seminars that we speak about. And I think that what I took away from today, for careers leaders, for employers, and for any professionals working in schools and colleges and, and um, across special education and alternative provision, is that we're giving you the permission to disrupt the status quo when it comes to work experience. We are not talking, we've heard today, we are not talking anymore about a world where one week of work experience is the sole answer to our challenges of inspiring young people. And what I've really heard from today is a, a message of taking young people on a journey from discovery through to depth. So discovering what's available out there, learning what excites them and inspires them, through to then a position like Iman is in where she can really explore her specialist area in a position of depth. And I would challenge us as, as educationalists to be able to say how we would do that through a one week work experience placement. I think it's almost impossible. So it's my challenge to the education system at this point to say, let's just pause for a moment on experiences of the workplace. The Gatsby benchmarks have given us a framework to look at this in a more intelligent way to start to think how we layer these opportunities for young people so that they are building a program of experiences of the workplace that gives them some real impact at the end of it. And so my question to myself as a, as a head teacher, a former head teacher would be, actually, what are the learning outcomes for my experiences of the workplace program in my schools? If I send my young people out for a week, that's 30 hours of learning. How do I connect 30 hours of learning into outcomes and impact for every single young person that passes through the door of my school? And I think then when we pause and reflect in that way, we can review our programs in a really meaningful way. But the key to all of that, which as we've heard in spades this morning on this stage, is a strategy. A strategy for a progressive program which enables young people to actually um, use those experiences to best effect. So my call to action to everybody this morning is to stop, review, reflect, 
And then think about how you reinvent experiences, the workplace for all of your young people that you come into contact with, into contact with no matter how you do that. So um, to try and be as helpful as possible, we've tried to distill a series of resources, some inspiration, some materials into our um, corporate website and also on our resource directory for the careers and enterprise company. Those of you that are engaged with this this morning will receive direct links to those resources. And we really want to inspire you to continue this conversation with us, to work as a sector to really drive experiences forward for young people. So it just remains for me to say thank you so much for engaging with us this morning and let's continue the conversation. Thanks very much. Thank you.